Warning, this is a sensitive movie that deals with extreme bullying and violence. There are scenes that you may find distressing, so be warned. This is the story of Haruka Nozaki in her hellish school life led by her tormentors, Teiko Oguro, Yoshi Tachibana, Hidetoshi Kuga, Hiroaki Mamiya, Sutomu Ikigawa, Risako Kato, Arisa Sakura, and Rumi Sayama. A word of warning, this story does not have a happy ending. Nozaki opened her shoe locker only to find that it was taken again. She found the culprits, her usual bullies. They then toss it in a landfill pit which forced Nozaki to go down and get it. She slipped and got mud all over her and the trio bursts out laughing. After a brief stare down, Teiko left and the group followed. Nozaki went home all filthy and was met with her little sister and parents. They all broke down when they saw her. The next day her father went to school to discuss the matter of bullying. Nozaki's homeroom teacher, Kyoko, wanted nothing to do with it. With downcast eyes, she suggested to leave things be since the school will be permanently closed after graduation anyway. As the father was leaving the school, he was kicked in the back by Kuga, using shoes with thumbtacks. Back in the classroom, the boys continued to torment Nozaki by leaving a dead crow in her desk. The group kept on taunting the teacher to do something but she ignored them. Aiba stood up for Nozaki and asked them to stop, Kuga backed down. The homeroom teacher couldn't take the abuse anymore and went out and puked at the corridor. At home, Nozaki's mother is tending to her father's wounds. He advised Nozaki to not go back to school anymore and to just lay low at home. She could just wait out the last two months before graduation. With no one to bully, the group is feeling restless. They then decided to shift their target to Rumi. Yoshi ordered her to go and check up on Nozaki and to bring her back, otherwise she'll get bullied instead. She stabbed her with a pin for good measure. At Nozaki's place, Rumi was asking if she is still sick and that she should go back to school if she's feeling better. She wanted to borrow the music CD, and as Nozaki reaches out for it, Rumi took her photo as proof. She then admitted that if she doesn't come to school that she'll get targeted instead. Nozaki told her that she's not going to come back. Having failed to bring back Nozaki, Rumi became the official target. The group trapped her in a locker while banging on it. They gave Nozaki's music CD to Teiko. Nozaki was happily walking along a forest trail with her little sister when they encountered Aiba. After walking together for a while, her sister asked to get their photo taken, which he agreed. Back at the classroom, Teiko is carelessly cutting Rumi's hair. She casually grins to gain the group's approval but more importantly, Teiko's. Yoshi tells Rumi that everything will stop if she just bring Nozaki back. She tells her that it's all Nozaki's fault this is happening and that she must hate her. Rumi declared that she wants to kill Nozaki. Nozaki and Aiba are going out on a walk date. Her sister gave her a necklace just before she leaves and complimented the two on being a couple before waving them off. They stopped to rest on a bridge on a spot overlooking the city. Their hands touched affectionately at the right moment. They continued walking along a stream with Aiba taking photos of Nozaki as they go. It was already dark when they returned home, when they encountered Risako and Yuri, who then hurriedly went away. There's fire over at the distance. It's Nozaki's home, and her family was still inside. Nozaki broke down in tears but Aiba went inside and managed to save her little sister. She miraculously survived and was taken to a hospital. Nozaki's grandfather sadly confirms the bodies of her parents. He then joined Nozaki in watching over her little sister. He mentioned that her father protected her sister by embracing her so she won't burn. The next day she moved in with her grandfather. Meanwhile the group is having a guilt fest, Risako and Yuri are both fearful that they'll get caught, but Kuga assured them that they don't have evidence. The group is feeling distressed, but despite what happened, Rumi is looking pleased with herself. Teiko was sitting alone in class when Rumi excitedly approached her. Rumi wanted to tell her what she did to Nozaki's family, but Teiko stabbed her with a pencil. When she arrived home after school, her father was there to meet her. He doesn't approve of Teiko's dream of becoming a beautician and told her she's not going to Tokyo for it. Her father tells her that he controls her future, much to her dismay. Ikigawa and Mamiya are shooting crows with an airsoft gun and crossbow. Ikigawa confided with Mamiya that he felt exhilaration during that day. He shot a crow, and Mamiya called him twisted for thinking that, and laughed at him. Rumi's obsession with Teiko is becoming apparent with her notebook filled with drawings of her. She scratches her stab wound as if relishing it. 
Nozaki eventually showed up in class much to the surprise of everybody. Aiba offered to help her but she just brushed him off. After class, she was led by Yoshi and the other two back to the pit. Risako is racked up with guilt that she almost confessed but Yuri stopped her. Yoshi just casually asked Nozaki to kill herself before stabbing her with a pin. She fell into the pit and everyone joined her. Yoshi kept taunting Nozaki about how she felt alive after watching her mother burn alive. Nozaki reached her breaking point and stabbed Yoshi in the eye with a nail. While Yoshi was still delirious and confused, Nozaki found a pipe nearby and smashed Yoshi's head in. She then violently released all her pent-up rage at that moment. She then turned her attention on the other two which panicked and tried to escape. Risako tried to clumsily beg for her life but got her fingers chopped off. While she's writhing in agony, Nozaki approached Sakura. Sakura is trying her hardest to get out of the pit. She sliced her heel and she fell and hit her head badly. She finished off Risako in the same brutal fashion as Yoshi. Oh his way home, Kuga came across Nozaki. He tried talking to her but got irate when she ignored him. When he shoved her, he realized that he was stabbed. And when he looked up again, Nozaki slashed his cheek. Kuga screamed in pain. He tried to get away, crawling on the snow. Nozaki ambled towards him, knife in hand. She followed him up a hill. Kuga is really struggling to right himself but lost his balance and fell downhill. Kuga is a broken mess. Nozaki watches on as he cries in agony, the cut on his cheek worsening. Nozaki surveys the grisly scene then left him to die in the snow. Rumi got a call from Ikigawa and Mamiya. The two boys suspect that Nozaki is behind all their friends' disappearances. Okay, then cool, Mamiya cool. warned Rumi that she could be next since she's the mastermind. He also told her that they'll get Nozaki first before she gets to them. The next day, they followed her in the woods. Mamiya shot her with a crossbow but missed. Nozaki disappeared, so Mamiya gave Ikigawa a knife and told him the hunt is on. Mamiya taunted Nozaki, shouting that he threatened her father with the crossbow and set them on fire. Ikigawa found Nozaki first, who seemed to radiate ethereal beauty. He proceeded to tackle and pin her to the frozen ground. He tried to kiss her but she turned away which angered him. Just as he's about to stab her, Nozaki found a pair of snips and stuck it up his nose and clipped it. Ikigawa howled in pain. Mamiya found them and tried to shoot but can't get a clear shot. He shot an arrow but hit Ikigawa instead. Ikigawa slowly turned and charged Mamiya, all the while screaming that he loves Nozaki. He kicked free from his grasp but as he turned around, Nozaki immediately stabs him. She continued to hurt him as Mamiya struggles with his guts hanging out. He found the crossbow and painstakingly reloads it but Nozaki stabbed him at the back of his neck. Aiba visited Nozaki out of concern, she came out to meet him. The two went out for a walk back to their viewing spot. Aiba was worried that he won't be able to see Nozaki again, and that he always wanted to see her. Nozaki was suppressing her emotions by biting her lips. She bit too hard that it bled, but she couldn't bear it anymore. She broke down and let go. All her pain and anguish were released that instant. She collapsed on the ground sobbing. Aiba knelt down and comforted her. He made a solemn promise to protect her. Nozaki returned his embrace, finally realizing that she's not alone. Overcome with emotions, Aiba kissed her and shared her blood on their lips, the snow falling relentlessly around them. At the hospital, Nozaki's grandfather is asking her to move with him back to Tokyo when the snow melts. He's also going to transfer her little sister there, and the papers are underway. Nozaki apologized to him and to her sister, letting him know that she wanted to stay in town. Her grandfather told her that it's okay. Meanwhile, Aiba was telling his grandmother that he's going to move to Tokyo to be with Nozaki. One night, Rumi went back to the landfill pit. As she was exploring it, she stumbled on the snow and discovered the dead bodies. She fell again and frantically finds her phone and calls Teiko. Meanwhile, Teiko is at home and just ignored her calls. The next day, Rumi tried to call again and Teiko finally answered. Rumi told Teiko that Nozaki is going to kill her. Teiko dismissed this but Rumi added that she found the dead bodies of her friends back at the landfill. She said that either one of them could be next. Teiko told her that she has done nothing to deserve it. Rumi asked if she hated Nozaki for stealing away Aiba, but Teiko denied even liking Aiba. Rumi then asked why she let everyone else bully Nozaki. 
When Teiko couldn't answer, Rumi assumed that Teiko actually likes Nozaki. Teiko hangs up, and Rumi tore all her drawings of Teiko in a rage. Faced with the hard truth, Teiko realized the consequences of her actions. She took the music CD and went to Nozaki's house. She called out but nobody answered. She left the CD but changed her mind. As she was walking back, a bus drove past. Nozaki was on it and both exchanged glances. Nozaki and her grandfather got off but she stayed back to meet with Teiko. Teiko gave back her music CD. They both sat down and talked about the past. Nozaki and Teiko were actually best friends back in the day. A flashback shows Aiba confessing to Nozaki with Teiko looking resentful. But even then Teiko was still unable to tell her the truth, that she was never jealous, that she wanted Nozaki all for herself. They eventually parted ways but Teiko came back, knelt and begged for Nozaki's forgiveness. Nozaki was silent and didn't reply. Teiko is walking back when she was suddenly attacked from behind. She managed to narrowly avoid it. It was Rumi armed with a knife. Teiko also armed herself and approached her but Rumi suddenly slashed her. Teiko backed away, and Rumi is reveling in her pain that the mighty Teiko can scream. Teiko angrily charges but was hit by a rock. She crumbled down on the ground bleeding and screaming. Rumi on the other hand is sadistically enjoying herself. Rumi then sprinted towards Teiko but she kicked him out of the way, while Teiko was struggling to get up. Rumi stabbed her hand. She kept stabbing and stabbing until Teiko fought back and kneed her in the gut. Teiko grabbed her knife and condemned Rumi for what she did to Nozaki's family, and that she was sick of people clinging to her and then going crazy. Teiko sarcastically asks Rumi if she thinks she'll get her affection if Rumi kills Nozaki. Rumi sadly says that she did it all for her. Teiko calls her a murderer, and Rumi loses it. She bolts towards Teiko with the knife. Teiko likewise readies herself. Teiko manages to slash Rumi's face but she kept going and stabbed Teiko in the chest. Teiko collapses on the ground. Rumi expresses her admiration to Teiko but she now sees her as a dirty rag. As Teiko lay bleeding on the snow, Rumi walks away. Nozaki received a call from Aiba where he explained to her that he planned to move to Tokyo with her and that they should live together. She replied that she might not be able to live with him. When Aiba pressed why, Nozaki said that you'll understand when spring comes and he should just go to a school he wanted. But Aiba couldn't let the matter go and reminded her that he vowed to protect her. A distraught Aiba was furious that Nozaki chose her family instead of him and he destroyed the phone. Back in the living room, Aiba's grandmother was severely beaten up. His grandmother asked him why he did it and if he was the one who killed his father. Aiba said that he simply stopped him from always beating his mother, but that he also has to kill his mother since he thinks she's sad that no one is beating her anymore. He then started washing his hands and mentions that he'll visit Nozaki's grandfather tomorrow. Back at the school, Kyoko is hounded by the missing student's parents. The group harassed her and even brought her past where she herself was once bullied. Yoshi's father accused her of perhaps killing the students since they scare her so much. Kyoko couldn't take it anymore and lashes out at the parents that she could forget her sad past and all she wanted was to go to school, even as a teacher. She puked again and stormed out the door. The other parents started chasing her. Kyoko tripped on the road, but there was an oncoming snowplow. She looked at it and finally found peace. Nozaki is on her way to the hospital to visit her little sister but also found Rumi there. She was just about to burn her sister again. Nozaki glared at her with killing intent. Rumi tells her it's hopeless but got startled when she saw the sister sitting up. Nozaki started choking her, but she got distracted by the medical machine, and Rumi got away. Aiba visited Nozaki at the hospital, but a nurse alerted her that her grandfather was attacked at home. She saw him being wheeled in and came to realize who has done it. Nozaki chased Aiba down the forest trail and confronts him. She demanded to see his hands but he still hid them. She eventually forced them out and saw the raw wounds on them. Aiba tells her that it was the result of trying to convince his grandmother and Nozaki's grandfather, and he did it for both of them. They need to understand that they have to be together. He tried to embrace her, but she moved away, then Rumi appeared out of the blue. A flashback shows the group with Rumi. Rumi declares that she wanted to kill Nozaki, but the rest of the group was doubting her. She then insists that she'll pour kerosene and burn her. The next scene shows Rumi carrying a heavy petrol jerry can with the group pressing her on. 
Rumi again expressed her resolve and looked at Teiko for approval. Teiko simply dismissed them and went home. Rumi was smiling satisfied while watching her go. They made it to Nozaki's house and Rumi started dousing it with kerosene. The mother stepped out and told them all to stop. Rumi even doused her. Kuga threatened her with a lit match, and Mamiya told him he wanted to see a human burn. The match burned Kuga, and he let go because of the pain which lit the house and the mother. Nozaki's father then came around and tried to help her but Mamiya shot him. Rumi then started pouring kerosene inside the house too ignoring the little sister's cries. The father desperately tried to protect his daughter. Rumi then lit a match much to the other girl's horror. She then dropped it setting the family alight. They all ran away and left the family burning. Rumi mercilessly taunted Nozaki like a deranged lunatic, recalling the story and describing the stench of her burning family. Nozaki angrily ran towards her but Rumi was ready. She plunged a knife to Nozaki's gut. Nozaki staggered and fell backwards. Aiba ran and started beating up Rumi. Blinded by fury, he rained down punches after punches. She collapses slowly on the ground. Aiba then stood up and grabbed a piece of branch nearby. He then stabbed Rumi in the neck. After she was gone, he turned around and tells Nozaki that everything is all right now. Nozaki, however, found out about Aiba's secret photos when his bag fell. It shows his father and sister on fire. Aiba tells her that he was moved by his father's heroic act during the fire that he had to take a photo of it. He was planning to show it to Nozaki one day since he was the ideal father figure. Nozaki couldn't believe what she's hearing. She painfully removed the knife and moved to attack Aiba, but he quickly got out of the way. Aiba felt betrayed that Nozaki will try to kill him that he also started beating her up. He asks her why she won't just stay with him since her sister and grandfather will soon die anyway. In an act of twisted pleasure, Aiba retrieves his camera and takes her picture. Then he got distracted by the blossoming liver leaf. Aiba compares the flower to Nozaki, who is both strong and resilient. He then tells her that if she promises to live with him that he'll save her, otherwise she'll die here. He raised his camera again to take a final picture of her. Nozaki fished Mamiya's crossbow from the snow, aimed it, and fired. The arrow went through the camera straight into Aiba's head. He dropped the camera and died. Nozaki tried walking back but her injuries are heavy. She took one final look at her necklace and crumbles on the ground. Sometime later, it's the school's graduation day. Teiko survived. Her name was called and she elegantly receives her diploma. After the ceremonies, she went back to the classroom. She remembers a fond memory of her and Nozaki where they both promised to go to Tokyo together. They both gleefully look out the window. As Teiko also looks on through the window, she recalls the song in Nozaki's CD. Nozaki wanted her to hold her head up high to live on.